the book of Ruth, <clears throat> the book of Ruth and chapter 1. And the subject before us this evening is in four parts. Departure, distress, devotion, and finally, declaration. Now, the book of Ruth is set at a period of, in the history of the children of Israel when the judges ruled in Judea. In the good times, God was worshipped as the king, and the judges ruled with integrity and with justice. But in the bad times, God was forsaken, and the rule of justice and integrity, uh, so that judgment as a consequence from God followed. This was a time in the uh, history of the Jewish nation when there was a constant cycle in their relationship with God. Departure from God resulted in deprivation and distress under his justice and judgment. But then when a faithful judge was raised up again by the Lord in his goodness, then repentance resulted in restoration and the richness of God's renewed blessing. And so there was this constant cycle going on. And the book of Ruth commences at a time uh, of deprivation, when the land was under the judgment of God. Bethlehem, normally known as the house of bread, becomes the place destitute of bread. Now, a question arises for our consideration this evening, which really comes out clearly at the beginning of the book of Ruth. How do we respond to the difficult times? How do we respond in the difficult days? How do we respond in times of deprivation? Now, twice we are told in the book of Judges that every man did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. And when the Lord raised up judges, we are told there were still those who still did not listen, but they did their own thing. The Old Testament response of Elimelech as the leader of the family is an example that is given to us by God of doing what seemed right in his view without applying biblical principles to his decision making. We will see that his guidance was directed through humanistic thinking <coughs> which lacked the fear of God. In the end, God overruled in his sovereign correction and mercy and judgment and he turned sorrow into blessing. God, according to his marvelous grace, turned bitterness into blessing. However, God's overruling mercy must never be used in our decision making as a justification for willful departure from God's way. We must never approach decisions in our life and we think, well, we'll do what is right in our own eyes. God will sort it out in the end because God is sovereign. Now we can look at the book of Ruth because we know the beginning, the middle and the end. And we can say, well, it all turned out right in the end. It's an amazing book. Ruth marries Boaz uh, and they have a, 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 a little boy and it's all in the genealogy of Christ. Surely, the whole book is full of decision-making which is correct and right. God, oh God, it all turned out right in the end. But we have to be very careful with presumption. We have to be very careful when we read God's word and not to read into it in the wrong way and depart from the basic biblical principles of dependence upon God. And uh, especially in our decision making, doing so in the fear of the Lord. We must consider first then some of the problems when making decisions that are contrary to the word of God. And we know that in chapter 1 of the book of Ruth, they obviously left Bethlehem to go to Moab with hope. They went out full, they came back empty. There was death in Moab. Imagine how poor Naomi must have felt 
She was led there by her husband. He was the head of the house. And in Moab, she lost her husband and her two sons. And Naomi was distraught. And she acknowledges that she was in a spirit of bitterness. But we see how God is brought, brings Naomi from bitterness to blessing. So I want us to look at the first point then this, e this evening now, departure. And that is found in verses 1 to 5 that Pastor Jonathan Northern read to us. <clears throat> And departure really sums up uh, the physical action and the spiritual state of Elimelech. And this is characterized in three ways. First of all, in verse 1, we read of independence. So it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. We don't read of the fear of the Lord. We don't read of prayer. We don't read of a man seeking the will of the Lord. We just read of a man coming to a decision and uh, uh, he, he went to sojourn in the country of Moab. Now the name Elimelech means my God is king. Yet he acts in a way of independence from God. Elimelech was evidently a man of substance. He had the wealth. He could do as he pleased in the sense that he had the power of wealth to, uh, to go and live where he chose. Jewish historians tell us that he was an important man, both of substance and influence in Bethlehem. He was like a prince. Perhaps he thought he could independently buy his way out of trouble. But we know from the end of the book of Ruth that he must have taken out a mortgage on his land to raise some money for this venture. But later on, it was left to Boaz to redeem the land back into the family after the death of Elimelech. At this time, business was bad in Bethlehem. Things were very tight. There was recession. There was famine. The economy was in recession. There was little prospect of profit. And it seems that Elimelech thought and realized he had a better opportunity for his investment, for his business deals with the people in the land of Moab. But in Moab dwelt the enemies of Israel, the enemies of God. And this, the step that was taken and justified to his relations, probably under the cover of providing for his wife and family. But he was going into Moab. He was taking his wife and his two sons into an idolatrous land. He, as the head of the home, has made the decision to up sticks and go into an idolatrous land. Elimelech could afford to travel down to Moab. Why not depart from Bethlehem? Elimelech was financially dependent independent. Why not exert his financial independence and do as he pleased? Well, we read of this attitude in the letter of James in chapter 4, verses 13 through 15. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city. We'll spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. Whereas, do you not know what will happen tomorrow? Well, what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. Well, Elimelech and his two sons, their life did prove to be but a vapor. It was gone. Naomi testifies later on that she went out of Bethlehem full but she came back empty. And the fullness that Naomi speaks about is not only a financial fullness, which evidently they did have, but as a married couple, they were full of independence. Now, it's very important for us to remember at this juncture that there was another wealthy man in Bethlehem by the name of Boaz, and he stayed in Bethlehem. 
He patiently waited upon God in the trial and in the tribulation. And as a landowner, the pain of the famine and the judgment on the land of Israel would have hit Boaz extremely hard. But Boaz, by faith and dependence upon God, ultimately entered into abundant blessing. While Elimelech, in an act of independence from God, goes down to Moab, and the outcome is death. And there's so many spiritual uh, lessons to learn from this step here. The danger of going down into Moab, the danger of trying to justify our decision-making to take a step, which in reality we know deep down in our heart we're going into worldliness. We can see here the danger then of using the needs of the family as an excuse for disobedience. Surely there were better prospects then for his sons in Moab. I am sure Elimelech could rationalize his decision making. He could rationalize it saying, look, we've got a famine in the land here. I'm doing what's best for my family. I'm doing what's best for my family. And what sort of kindness did it turn out to be? The problem for Elimelech was he was walking not by faith, but by sight. He had not learned from the problem of his forefather Abraham, who also experienced a time of famine. And when Abraham was faced with famine in the land of promise, he went down into Egypt and he got into trouble in Egypt. And Abraham learned from this experience and went on to be known as the father of faith. Walking by faith and not by sight means resting on the promises of God in the midst of trial, in the midst of ad adversity, believing that God will bring us through. And we're not to be driven by our own wisdom, feelings or circumstances alone. Job wrote, who hath hardened himself against God and prospered? But secondly, we look in this uh, first part of denial, denial. By taking this action, Elimelech showed that he was actually in a state of denial. The greatest need in Bethlehem was repentance. That's what would have brought the end of the famine. The greatest need in Bethlehem was repentance, not departure. Because in the land of blessing, when a famine arose, it meant quite simply, in the way God dealt with the land at those times, there had been a departure from the ways of God. And God told the children of Israel, if you obey my word, there will be abundant blessing, there will be provision, and God is always faithful to his word. So the greatest need in Bethlehem was for repentance, not departure from Bethlehem. By taking this action, Elimelech was refusing to face up to the real problem in his life. And a man has to learn the problems of his own heart before his other problems are addressed. So often in life, activity and action becomes replacements for what God has called on us to do. Elimelech could afford financially to run away from the material famine through activity and movement, but he couldn't run away from the spiritual famine in his life. And he took that spiritual backslide in with him into Moab. And God was calling him to repentance, but in this state of denial, he refused to search his own heart. And then we have rejection. Living in the land of Moab, renowned for its idolatry, was a rejection of God. The people of Moab were descendants of a wrong relationship between Lot and his firstborn daughter. And when the Israelites traveled from Egypt to Canaan, the Moabites refused to help the children of Israel. Later they hired Balaam 
in a futile attempt to curse the Israelites. And during the time of the judges, the Moabites invaded Israel. They ruled over them for 18 years. So going to Moab symbolizes rejection of God and aligning oneself to idols. And Limelech probably justified his actions by attempting to treat this move as only temporary. That's another way that Satan tempts us. And another way in which we can rationalize disobedience and backsliding. The word sojourn here, uh, it says uh, uh, he went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the word sojourn here has the meaning of a temporary dwelling place. So that's how he it said to the people of Bethlehem, I'm just going for a short while to sojourn. This is a temporary uh, measure. Uh, we'll be back uh, uh, in a while. But I'm just going down to sojourn in the land of Moab. A temporary measure taken to alleviate the situation he found himself, even if it meant compromise. This is sometimes the case in our lives. We can justify our initial actions by saying, it is only for a short while, this is a temporary measure to get me out of a fix, when all the while, deep in our heart, we are open to even accepting such a lifestyle on a more permanent basis. The fact that the two sons married to Moabitish women and dwelt there ten years seems to confirm the reality that they were actually open to settling down in an idolatrous land. They were there ten years, the two sons. Elimelech had died quite early on. But they were there ten years. Well, ten years is not really, in fairness, it's not really sojourning, is it? It's not a temporary, that's quite a long while, ten years. It seems that they had settled down in Moab. What we do know is that the hand of the Lord went out against them against the family while in Moab. And the book of Proverbs says to us that there is a way which seemeth to be right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Elimelech majored on the material, not the spiritual. And this governed his approach to his decision making. And going down to Moab without direction from God made a statement of rejection and independence from God. It came to pass that in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land and a certain man of Bethlehem Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech and the name of his wife Naomi and the name of his two sons Malon and Chilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem Judah and they came into the country of Moab and continued there. But then we come to distress their second point, and that is in verses 6 through to 13. Uh, the Lord had uh, come down and, uh, uh, in solemn judgment upon the family in God's sovereign permissive will. Malon and uh, if Elimelech, her name is husband, died. She was left and her two sons, and they then got married uh, and uh, then she was left of her two sons and her husband too, because they also died. So this poor woman, Naomi, was now bereft of her husband and her two sons and was left with her daughter-in-laws. Now distress describes the obvious state of Naomi. Her name means pleasant one, but Naomi didn't feel very pleasant. She was in considerable distress. And I want to consider how this distress, understandable distress in many ways, but I want to see how this distress worked itself out in the life of Naomi. Naomi had experienced a very traumatic time. Her husband and two sons had died. She was alone, a traumatic experience. And Naomi was undoubtedly at this time a suffering in her grief from a type of depression. There was a, a bitterness of soul. She acknowledges this. Don't call me Mara, bitterness. 
the Lord has, has gone out against me. This is what she testifies later on. The Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me, and I feel this bitterness in my soul. And as this depression set in, in Naomi's life, it distorted her thinking and her testimony at this particular time. Undoubtedly, up until this time, Naomi had a, a, a mar remarkable testimony because her daughters recognized it. Her daughters-in-law recognized it. But now, at this particular time in her life, uh, when she's under such pressure and stress and distress, sadly, uh, there was confusion in her testimony. And we see this in uh, verses 8 through to 14. Naomi's attitude and words in her distress led at this point to confusion in her testimony and witness. Undoubtedly, Mammy had in her mind to test whether her two daughter-in-laws were really willing to leave Moab. But the way in which Naomi attempts to persuade her daughters to go back to Moab was unwise, undoubtedly unwise. It raises question marks about her thought process at the time. Her approach to this crisis and the crossroads in life is not a pattern that we should follow ourselves. We need to be so careful about the advice that we give and the spirit in which we give advice. Naomi was undoubtedly deeply distressed. She acknowledged the hand of the Lord had gone out against her, but she was not only distressed for herself, but for her daughters-in-law. They'd lost husbands. However, in her distress, in her despondency, in her depression, the advice she gives to her daughter-in-laws is actually humanistic. Return to Moab. The issue for Naomi seems to be their future comfort and support, simply in her advice to get them remarried. And her obvious concern must have appeared to Orpah and Ruth to major on the material, not the spiritual. Encouraging her daughter-in-laws to go back to Moab and marry unbelievers for the sake of having a husband and a quiet life, which is in effect what she is saying, the Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband, and she kissed them and they lifted up their voices and wept. Wishing them God's blessing on such a return to Moab is a highly questionable approach to use. There is no biblical warrant to such an approach. It is to spiritualize ungodly advice. To spiritualize Ungodly advice is to say to someone, you go down to Moab, it's going to be easier for you. You may find comfort in Moab. You can restart your life in Moab in the middle of the land of idolatry and the Lord bless you and be with you. And we know that what Naomi was proposing to her daughter-in-laws in the case of Ruth was directly contrary to God's will. And God had to overrule through the testimony of Ruth. And we notice here in the chapter that we read that Ruth, as a new believer, had to rebuke Naomi, asking her to stop giving such advice. Now, God had predetermined that Ruth would marry Boaz and be in the line of the genealogy of the Messiah. But this is because God's ways are higher than airways and his thoughts and air thoughts. We must never see God's overruling and sovereign overruling and God's ways are being higher than airways as being a compromise with air decisions taken uh, without due reference to uh, the word of God. God overrules because he does so in mercy and in love and in grace. God can and does bring blessing out of bitterness. He brings triumph out of trial. 
But this is God's amazing mercy. This is God's amazing sovereign overruling. It's not a vindication for us to give unbiblical advice. It is really an evidence of God's power to bring about his purposes despite our folly, despite our unwise advice. It's never good for us to spiritualize unbiblical advice because we look back and we can see a blessed outcome. Rather, we should look and marvel at the amazing grace of God to overrule our folly. To overrule here the advice of Naomi uh, to go back to Moab that was given by her in a time of despondency and distress and bitterness of soul. If we look at the pattern set by the Lord for such an occasion of crossroads in life, we notice a different approach, a perfect approach. The approach of the Lord Jesus to the crossroads in life simply outlines the cost of following him. If you follow me, there's going to be a cost. He encourages us to take up our cross and follow him, but warns us it is going to be a difficult pathway, but he will never leave us or forsake us. And so here, Naomi uh, is seeking God's blessing upon a union in Moab, and uh, and really spiritualizing pragmatic advice. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Can we really ask the Lord to deal kindly with us when we know we are returning to an idolatrous land or we're backsliding? What kind of rest did Naomi have in mind? Orpah took her mother-in-law's advice. She did as she was told. She returned. And by a Naomi's own admission later, she went back to her gods. So Naomi must have known that in advising her daughter-in-laws to go back to Moab, she understood what that meant. It was going back to the gods of Moab. And Orpah has gone back to her gods. Well, we know uh, uh, that Orpah uh, was behaving here as an unbeliever. She was going back to her gods. And perhaps even though she had married the, uh, one of the sons of Elimelech, perhaps she was just a professing believer, not really a believer in the heart. Uh, and uh, so when the test came and the crisis came and the opportunity came back to go back into the world, she took that advice. But we need to remember that Orpah could always say in her life, well, mum-in-law told me to come back to Moab. So when she justified her idolatry and she justified that idolatrous life back in Moab, she could always look back and say, well, actually, I only did as I was told. And it becomes an excuse. I wonder when restored to a proper relationship with God, Naomi regretted that conversation with Orpah. You know... We sometimes look back with sadness at times of our conversations that we have had with others in distress and we become bitter in our soul and we've said unwise things. We've perhaps given unwise advice. We've perhaps been angry in our spirit with God and we felt hard done by and we felt that uh, God's gone out against me uh, 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 and it's just not fair. It's not just of God. And it affects the way we speak. And we become cynical and hard and consumed with our grief. We need to be very careful uh, when advising in times of despondency. When we're feeling depressed, be very careful. Give an advice. Because when left to ourselves, our advice can be very cynical. But the God of all grace, he doesn't leave name in that condition. A better day is coming. There is hope. So look at verse 16. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to follow, return from following after thee, for whither thou goest I will go, and where thou lodgest I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. 
And in verse 21, I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. There is a danger when distressed of forgetting the previously encouraging aspects of our witness. You see, when we're down and we're depressed, we only remember the bad things. We only remember the failures. We don't remember the positive sides. And this is what's happened to Naomi. He's looking back and she's only remembering. But Ruth actually can see something in her mother-in-law, even at this time, when she can see her mother-in-law in deep distress of spirit and deep bitterness of soul. There's still a light. It hasn't ruined her testimony completely because she can see her mother-in-law. She loves her mother-in-law. And she remembers the times when her mother-in-law has given her biblical advice and, and led her in the ways of God. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. And in the distress of Naomi, the Lord has given her hope. The Lord is still using her. The Lord hasn't given up on Naomi. Uh, despite her present condition, it is evident that in previous days she had been a good witness to Ruth and Ruth was attracted to her mother-in-law. She knew that in the better times she had been a godly, loving witness. She had seen in the life of Naomi genuine uh, and proven belief in God and her testimony had already spoken to her heart. And despite the bad advice Naomi was now giving to tell her daughter-in-laws to go back to Moab, Ruth remembered the previous consistent testimony of Naomi in the family home as her mother-in-law, even after Elimelech's death. The present bitterness of her testimony did not completely cloud and ruin the positive part of her testimony. And this is an encouragement for us this evening. Because sometimes we all say unwise things in the heat of the moment, in our despair, times of despondency, when all things seem to be against us. And sadly, we do dishonor the name of the Lord. But God in his grace and in his mercy is still willing to use previous positive elements of our testimony. The third point I want to bring is devotion and that is verses 14 through to 18. The testimony of Ruth is one of the most remarkable in all scripture. She had lost her husband, but she still believed, trusted God. She was willing to leave her homeland because of her trust in God. She had no prospect of marriage in Bethlehem. She had no money. She had no rights. She had no prospects materially. She was going to be a foreigner. She was going to be an outcast. And she had had no encouragement even verbally to come to Bethlehem from Naomi. She had been told to go back into Moab. And despite all of this, loading up against Ruth, she believed in God. She wanted to follow God. And she wanted to be with God's people. And there are four points to Ruth's testimony to take serious note in verses 16 through to 17. The first is correction. Ruth had to rebuke her mother-in-law, telling her to stop advising her to go back to Moab. Ruth was a believer who had come from an unbelieving family, yet she was already teaching Naomi a lesson. While Naomi focused upon her grief, and bitterness, consequently her testimony at that time was confused. But Ruth, as a new, a comparatively new believer, also in the same grief, she'd lost her husband. She focused upon God. Your people will be my people. Your God, my God. And her testimony was clear. The commentator Matthew Henry while acknowledging Naomi's motive was to test her daughters-in-law, he summarizes the danger of Naomi's approach to this test confirmed by Ruth's correction of her. Matthew Henry says, It is a great vexation and uneasiness to those that are resolved for God 
and religion to be tempted and solicited to alter their resolution. Entreat me not. The margin reads, be not against me. It's that strong. Note, we are to reckon those against us and really our enemies that would hinder us in their way to the heavenly Canaan land. Our relations they may be, but they cannot be our friends that would dissuade us or discourage us in the service of God and the work of religion. We might think that's quite severe of Matthew Henry, but, but he's really just focusing on this particular aspect of Naomi's testimony at this time. We, knew, we know a better day came. But then, first of all, we, uh, when the, then we see uh, in this uh, uh, testimony of Ruth, commitment. It, it, and also uh, in verse 16, I, where you go, whither you goest, I will go. Where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. Commitment. There was correction, now there's commitment. I will go with you wherever and whatever. There's confession. Thy God shall be my God. This is a wonderful statement of faith. Thy God, my God. This is faith shining, friends, in distress. Ruth has lost her husband, but she's looking to God and she's saying to Naomi, this is my God. I look to him by faith. This is consecration. Consecration, even unto death. Listen to this, verse 17. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. Total consecration, even unto death. This is a statement of unreserved faith in God. Wholehearted obedience to God. Steadfastly minded. When she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. Oh, we can see here the freshness and clarity of God-given faith in its infancy. Like a child depends upon its mother. Here we see uh, uh, Ruth uh, developing as a believer, as a, a little child in total dependence upon God. But then declaration, that is verses 20 to 21. We have it by way of confession in verses 20 through 21. In God's amazing dealings, it is Ruth who is used by the Lord to both correct, comfort, and encourage Naomi. So the two of them now go together to Bethlehem. And on her return to Bethlehem, Naomi requests that her name be called Mara. As you know, the name Mara means bitter. And the name is viewed the Almighty had dealt bitterly with her. And it seems that Naomi felt bitter in her spirit and she expressed God's dealings with her in that manner. This is how often Satan can upset us in our grief. Yet, the Word of God says, the sacrifices of God are of a broken spirit and a contrite heart, O God. Thou wilt not despise. And Naomi was a broken person. She was distressed. And it seems that Naomi, struggling with bitterness of spirit and her grief, uh, 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 actually moves gradually from bitterness uh, to confession. She makes a personal and humble confession. So you see how her bitterness is turning to confession. And she realizes that actually she is responsible before God in the action she took in going away from Bethlehem. This is what confession does. It, it brings us to the point where we realize we're accountable before God. And God is dealing with us in our life. And God has every right to deal with us in our life because he is Lord. So she says, I went out full. This is my testimony. I went out full. Perhaps she means here, I went out full of myself, full of my independence, full of my material wealth that I had at that time. But the Lord hath brought me again home empty. The Lord has done this. 
This is what confession accepts. It's humbling ourselves before God and acknowledging that God is the Lord of my life. He is dealing with me and he has every right to deal with me. And so we read here, I went out full and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then you call me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, that the Almighty hath afflicted me. The Lord is in this. God is in this. God is dealing with me. But in Naomi's darkest moments, there is confession here. And that brings a spark of light and realisation, which takes us into the blessing of God's grace in chapter 2. God does not break the bruised reed. He doesn't quench the smoking flax. And even though we have uh, been in the bitterness of spirit, even though we have been so depressed and despondent in a situation, and we perhaps said things we ought never have said, God doesn't give up on us. He doesn't crush us completely. But he will restore us. But in that rest restoration, there has to be confession on our part. There has to be a realization that God is the Lord of my life. I need to look to him and trust in him. And so she acknowledges the Lord's hand, not only in correction, but in her returning. The Lord hath brought me home again to himself, to fellowship with him, but I haven't come full of myself. All my independence has gone. I've come back empty to God. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. This is God's way of dealing with us. Because he loves us, because he cares for us. I return, I return humbled and empty under the almighty hand of God. What a blessed afterwards there is in the life of Naomi, who is corrected because she is a child of God. Now, I'm coming to the conclusion now. I've just got a final application to make this evening. It points us to Christ, encouraging us to return to him in our distress this evening. You remember that name you had heard, that there was bread in Bethlehem, and this encouraged her to return and here we can see a deeper, wonderful picture of Christ, the coming Messiah, in the news that she heard. It is said that she heard that the Lord had visited his people and given them bread. And hundreds of years later in Bethlehem, the Lord visited his people in the birth of Jesus Christ, the bread of life. Through the tender mercy of our God, the day spring from on high hath visited us to give us light, give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, just like Naomi was, to guide their feet into the way of peace. The Lord hath visited his people. Here is our hope in distress this evening. Ruth found Boaz in Bethlehem. Boaz is a type of Christ in his grace to Ruth. Ruth came to Bethlehem picturing the rejection of Moab, the world, and wholehearted faith in God, in Christ Jesus. Naomi returned to Bethlehem. She acknowledged the bitterness of soul, but confessed the reality of God's sovereign dealings. And in the end, both these two ladies were truly blessed in coming to Bethlehem. And that's where we have to come, in the picture of coming to Christ in our distress. We have to come empty. No point coming back to Christ, still with some of our ideas and doing a bargain with Christ, doing a bargain in our coming and our repentance. Say, well, I'll bring this part of my life back, but I'll just tuck away that little part of my life. No. We learn from Ruth 1, we've got to come back empty so that we might see Christ as our all in all. See Christ as the bread of life. That God has visited his people with the bread of life. Come, let us return unto the Lord. 
He hath torn, but he will heal us. He hath smitten, but he will bind us up. Amen.